everyone. Um, thank you for coming and wanting to learn about Zephyr. And I'm nice to see a few familiar faces in the audience. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today is some of the changes that have been emerging with Zephyr. Um, for those who are not familiar with it, Zephyr is an open source RTOS. And we've been you know, working on this project. It got launched in 2016. And what we're doing right now is we're starting to finally hit, um, see products emerge in the market. Um, it's an open source project. Everything is available to everyone. But uh, it's getting a very exciting time for the project right now. Um, my name is Kate Stewart, and I'm the director at the Linux Foundation. And Zephyr is one of the projects I help with. And so if you've got any questions as we go through it, please stop me and interrupt. And I'm happy to take questions, too, as we go. Um, yesterday, I was thrilled to see we actually had an announcement coming out from Nordic, who's one of Zephyr's Platinum members. And this is the um, ELDA system, which is basically controlling a mesh of lighting on the wall. And it's coming from a Beijing company. Oh, bring my microphone closer. Sorry, guys. It's um, coming from a Beijing company. And it is now out on the market. And it is based on Zephyr. So this type of change is finally hard. In the embedded space, it's very hard to understand what software is running in at the lower levels. And so one of the things that's a challenge for this project is to tell people, yeah, actually, there's products out there that are running Zephyr. And what was really nice with this one is that the CTO made it visible in this, in this blog post that it is using Zephyr. Now, it's, um, Nordic basically has basically wrapped a Zephyr image in with their reference kit, and people are using it to build products. And so there are reference kits out there from other manufacturers, uh, like Intel and Arc. And um, they have Zephyr available for these platforms as well. So you're seeing more and more of these kits starting to come out. And then products start to emerge afterwards. The challenge for the Zephyr project, because everything is open source, it's all free to download, is to figure out who's actually using it in an end product. So it becomes a bit of a detective game, figuring out which um, products are out there and who actually is going to market with Zephyr. Um, the first product we heard about initially at the start was by, um, let me just go show, no, it won't show there. Um, Gresh Gaming Toothbrush when we sort of launched, that was sort of seeded in. But since then, uh, there are smart glasses where there's a Zephyr in the frame, and this is for long distance drivers, and it's from a startup in France. And the idea is, if people are dozing and their heads are jerking, it signals makes the signal. And for safety, um, Morgana's got a Bluetooth gateway, so it's being used for communicating Bluetooth there. There's a smartwatch for kids for geo-tracking your kids. And the same company actually just came out with a um, core box. So uh, that little green box over there on the green is also um, from the same company but they're using it on garbage trucks. And so why would you stick an IoT device on a garbage truck? Well, you do it because it's got geo GPS and tilting and the, you know, the, the sensors for understanding whether the garbage truck is dumping or not. And they put these two things together, and there's a six-month battery life on this. And so they can weld it onto the side of the truck, and they can tell whether or not people are dumping um, garbage in places they shouldn't. They should only dump it in the landfills after they pay the fees, but people will go outside of that space and, um, you know, save the fees and dump it and, you know, make a problem in the environment. So by having these types of very lightweight tracking devices, you can, you know, there's some interesting applications that are actually good for everyone coming out. Um, another interesting one that's come out is the Anycare reindeer tracker. And so it's little earrings for the reindeers up in Norway. 
uh, for tracking the herds and making sure the herds are there. Um, on the flight over here, I was looking at, um, there's a documentary about the pandas in Chengdu and taking them back out to the wild. And they wear these big radio collars. Kind of struck me that hmm, maybe they could have something a lot lighter weight to track these pandas out in the wild as they rehabilitate into the wild systems. Um, so these types of applications in Zephyr and MBIoT and so forth are starting to be there. And the other one that's up on the top is the point home alarm. It's a very, very small little alarm. It's not got a camera, but it does have sound detection and a variety of other things. And you put it in your house to see if there's anything that's abnormal, like some breaking glass or noises that are there. And so that's another product that's emerged. Um, probably the one that's been most visible is the Pro Glove. And this is basically a, a hand-mounted glove that sits and there's a little thing and you just touch. So rather than holding a big device to look at your barcodes and get confirmation on your barcodes, it's integrated into your device in your in your into the glove. And this has actually gone through a second revision. Um, the Rev2 are the of the Pro Glove came out earlier this year, but it's been running Zephyr right from the very start. And they're kind of interesting in the sense that when I first met them at Embedded World, I was asking, you know, well, why don't you upstream your code? And they're going, oh, we're a startup. We can't, we can't, we can't. Too much work. Can't upstream. Um, and then someone else started to upstream an LED driver that was different than theirs. And then all of a sudden they realized, hmm, if we get this stuff upstream first, we have less maintenance down the road, which is part of the beauty of open source, as we've learned from Linux and other open source projects is if you're up there and you've got a good thing, a solution there, people can then um, build on it, but you also have less maintenance yourself. So having a good starting point is what we're starting to see. So um, the NAR box is an SSD drive that offloads pictures, and um, it was a big Kickstarter campaign, raised about 10 times the amount of money. So as you can see, Zephyr is hitting products and some of them are winning awards. The Intellinium shoes um, for noisy factory floor environments, they actually have four processes in them. And they've got a very interesting way they've architected it, and I'd encourage you to read the case study that we've got up on our website. But um, you know, the very forward thinkers are seeing Zephyr as useful, and they like the code base. And um, one of our platinum members is Odicon, and Odicon will be talking in August about how they're using it in the next generation of hearing aids. So not only is it coming in from startups, it's also starting to see from major companies. They're building their, you know, their key product lines around it. So it's starting to get there now. Um, this is from Google Analytics, and it looks over the last year. And what we are seeing is we are seeing a lot of interest in Zephyr. Um, in China and India, as well as European countries, okay? And you're starting to see these products emerge now from China, as well as these other sites. And so this is just people going and looking at our website. Well, they're looking at the website because there's something that's there that they care about. And then the next step after going to the website is to go on to GitHub and look at the source code. Now. The source code, um, one of the things you can see if you're a member of the project is you can sort of see the traffic stats. Normally you just can't. If you just went to GitHub today, you wouldn't be able to see this unless you're a member with commit access. Um, but if you can look at it, you can sort of see that we actually have, over a two-week period, which is the window it shows you, there's been 12,000, almost 12,000 clones of the repo. And there's been almost 1,900 unique people taking clones of the code. Now, if people are doing that sort of thing, they're doing it because they're making products or doing something with it. Our challenge is to figure out where those products are in the marketplace. <laughs> and then, you know, how many people are going there and how many unique visitors do we have and so forth. Um, you know, there's what? What's the number there? Sorry. You know, 81,000. That's a lot of people looking at the code. Um, and that's just in two weeks period. So 
that's kind of encouraging. So just a quick show of hands right now. How many here in the room have seen Zephyr before or gone to the website? Hands up if you've seen it, if you've been on the website. And I know there's a few here in the front row who have seen it, so. <laughs> okay. So just to, to give you some context about Zephyr, um, it's open source and it's a real-time operating system. And we actually have a very vibrant community for an embedded operating system. We have probably one of the most vibrant and most fast growing operating communities out there. Um, there's multiple architectures with tool support around them. And it is actually a very vendor neutral governance. No one company dominates it. And so, and people can come and participate in it without being members too. It is very open to people to submit things into the code repos and contribute technically. Um, we're using a permissive license on that. That was a decision that the project made when it started. Um, and it's very modular, so you only compile what you need. Zephyr is designed for things where Linux won't fit, and things that need long battery life and low resource consumption, okay? So you're talking something like 8K to 512K space for your stack, depending what you want to compile in, and you only compile in what you need. And this is what makes you that get very small. But we are, we released our LTS in April, um, which is LTS stands for long-term support. So those who are familiar with Linux understand the concept of a long-term support release. And we've taken that lesson from Linux because if you're always keeping up with development, it's changing very fast. But if you, but it's hard to sort of match up with the product cycle then. Whereas Linux has found that if you put out an LTS, you can link up your products with it and then keep just the security updates happening. So most of your Android phones or other phones that are you running Linux underneath are based on an LTS with updates. That's the sort of concept we're going after here too. And one of the things we're gonna be working on very hard over the next few years is actually getting it ready for safety audits. Because as you can see from a lot of these little applications in those products I was showing you, we're really heading towards working with people as well as working with um, sensors. And we wanna make sure we can use them in a safe way when people start really depending on them. So Zephyr um, currently supports these six architecture families. Um, more architecture families are welcome if you are using a different type of um, core processor and you'd like to get it up into Zephyr, start a discussion with the TSC and sort of say what you propose to do and there's double play rich receptive. It is not blocked to any architecture and we can certainly move it forward. Um, there's also uh, 32, most of these are all 32 bits, but we're seeing some of the 64 bit hardware parts come in there. Um, in particular, we've seen a 64 bit port show up from Intel and we're seeing one going in right now from RISC V. Okay. The other thing that we had a question for and a request for uh, for about the last couple of years was actually being native POSIX. And with the LTS, we finally have a native POSIX port, which lets us basically work with hypervisors and so forth. And it gives more flexibility for our test infrastructure as well. Now, when I went and checked this morning, uh, I had to update this slide. There was four more board ports than I had from the last time I looked. So we're up to 170 boards in the repo right now. And so there's a lot of good starting points out there. They're all at various levels, um, but there's some that we, you know, people are work on pretty hard and using for products. So there's a really good selection out there and they're all well documented because they can't put their boards into the repo until they put the documentation in with the port. So hopefully that's useful to people. And in fact, we actually have some manufacturers like um, Phytech and Electronuts are actually shipping their boards today with Zephyr images on them by default. Now, I don't know how many people can see this, but this is one of the real boards. So if you want to come see a little bit more detail on it afterwards, it's fine. Uh, happy to show it to you. But um, if there was someone else here in the room that was had one of them, it runs a Bluetooth mesh and it has a variety of sensors on it. And Phytech actually built these and donated them to the, some of these to the project. Um, 
they, they donated them at, uh, for a hackathon we had last um, October in Edinburgh, and we had a first session with them, and then we they gave us some to hand out at Embedded World. And so at Embedded World, we were handing some of them out to the developers who came by and asked for one. Um, but they have a lot of interesting sensors on them and some interesting dynamics to play with. So I'd encourage you to sort of check them out. And um, the Electronets, uh, the uh, Papper board is also running Zephyr. Now, the architecture stack for Zephyr is very rich right now, and it's getting richer. There's more things being added day by day. We actually have a pretty good um, networking stack in there that's stabilized, and we have probably one of the best Bluetooth low energies and mesh um, stories out there. In fact, a lot of people um, who have work experience with Zephyr in the past may be in one of um, Kyren's talk um, that's happening, unfortunately, in parallel with this. Otherwise, I would have liked to listen to that one, too, about um, using Bluetooth uh, with this device. So we've got, um, and the Bluetooth SIG has been putting out reference guides and using Zephyr as a prototyping vehicle. So we're, we're staying fairly current, and we're, when the new versions of the spec come out, we're usually there right with Zephyr right from the start, which has been great for the project. Um, that they're using it to prototype things out. And because the code base is very clean and very simple, you know, it's, it's uh, well-structured and very clean, it's easy to work with. But we do have the low energy, uh, 4.2 and 5.0, and we do have a mesh, the Bluetooth mesh, and we've got very good reference versions of that, which is why that first product you saw is running a mesh. Um, and we have a pretty optimized uh, networking stack available to this project now, too. Now, the community, um, when we started, the code base originally had come from Wind River and Intel. And we have nicely diversified with our LTS to a variety of participants um, working. So about a third of the contributions of the 114 release came from Intel. But then um, probably another third came from our members. And another third literally came from a community. We don't even know who they are. You know, we've got their names and their GitHub IDs, but that's about it. Um, where people have just found this a useful code base to work with and are using for their products. So we actually, this is really truly turning into a real good community project, which is part of the reason Linux types of things succeeded, is it was community, it was wider than just one or two companies. People see it useful enough for themselves that they can see how they can contribute. So they're motivated. And from the growth perspective, um, a funny thing happened on the way to contributors <laughs> or authors. Um, last week when I checked, there was 500, and then this morning when I checked, there was 499. So somehow one person, some ID emerged, or something happened, but I'm sort of sitting there waiting eagerly to look at the GitHub for the next, next new contributor into GitHub, because they will become the 500th, and hopefully after that, it will stay at 500. But I don't quite know why <laughs> we went down one, but we did over the weekend. Um, there's probably something logical there. Um, and I'm not quite sure how GitHub counts that part of it, but this, these are the stats on GitHub. You can go look at them yourself right now and just see. Um, and from the commit perspective, uh, we've over 31,000. So it's, you know, a fairly, it's not Linux, but it's about a tenth of the rate of Linux, which is pretty healthy for the embedded space. Now, the embedded space we started off with here, and the reason we started Zephyr is because we have a very fragmented embedded space, and of course, it's only gotten worse since then. But these are the different um, RTOSs that are out there, and they all have different strengths and properties. And I've got another talk I could, about the various weaknesses and strengths of these ones in terms of many dimensions like licensing um, and safety and security and so forth. But as you can see, there's a lot of options there for people. So the question is which option to choose. Um, this is that number. I was just telling you about uh, the 499. That purple line there is Zephyr, okay? Um, what I've been doing, and I'll show you in a minute, every month um, I go out to GitHub, and all of these projects, with one exception, are on GitHub today. 
Okay, and there's another place I can find the stats for that project. Um, and I just basically look and say, okay, over the last 30 days, you know, what are the new contributions? How many committers have been there? What's been the new co you know, contribution rates? And I just basically snapshot it. And then I've been putting it into a master chart, which I'll show you. And then what I did um, a month ago or so was I literally plotted it out over time. I took all my charts and I just, you know, put the points up. And it sort of nicely illustrates what we were suspecting based on the numbers, which is realistically Zephyr is breaking out of the um, trend lines from a contributor perspective. And I think likely before the next month, you know, probably before the end of the year, definitely, we should probably see Zephyr probably having the most contributors to open source project in this space. And with those contributors comes obviously commits. And as you can see here, the two that are probably the strongest um, in terms of a trend line are Zephyr and Embed, and with the strength of the ARM ecosystem. And those two are pretty much going parallel, but they're again on intercept too. To give some context, that top line there is um, Nutx. Nutx has been around since 2007. It's been attracting contributors since then. Zephyr's been around for just over three years. So the fact that we're almost up to that level and we're working towards being that level um, at, from just commits and contributions coming in is saying we're doing something right here. And I was telling you about that spreadsheet I was just capturing every month. Those, those are the numbers that I just pulled them yesterday. So if you wanted to go look on GitHub, you would see the numbers that match this. And you can see where I've taken it from. The methodology is very clear. You just basically go to GitHub for that project and go click on insights. And then click on traffic and adjust the traffic to be a one month interval rather than a one week interval, which is a default. And with that, you sort of see a picture. But what's worth highlighting is, you know, literally, I don't know if the mouse is showing here or not, but oh, just a second. Here's Zephyr here, 645. Um, over the last month. The next closest is free RTOS. Up till recently in the last month, they were not having much, go much traffic going out and they were squashing their commits. They suddenly realized they shouldn't squash their commits. So they're now starting to show up. But um, then after that, we've got embed. And then it sort of goes down from there. But as you can sort of see, it's almost double the rate of what's happening with these other projects. And from a community perspective and a commitment perspective, that's healthy. That's showing that people are interested and are interacting because it's suiting their purpose. It's letting them put their own deltas onto it. There's other information in this chart. Um, if anyone wants to talk about legal licensing issues, I'm happy to talk to you about it. I know way too much about that sort of stuff from other projects I work on. So NET is... Um, We've pretty much been the number one in the commits to our master for the last year, usually by about double, uh, roughly double what any other project has. Um, the total contributors, we've been number two in both number two the total contributors and number two in the total commits for, again for the last year. And I'm kind of looking forward to in a little bit, we hope we should be number one in the total contributors. So these are little things I'm just keeping an eye on and hoping we'll make things better over time. Now, Zephyr itself is more than just the RTOS. There's actually an ecosystem around it. And part of the reason it's exceeding is because we're building up this ecosystem, tool by tool, um, project by project, integration by integration. We also, in addition to just the kernel, which is that center part here, Zephyr OS, there is uh, SDK and development environments around it. And they just introduced West as a way of um, building things together. And then we actually have projects outside Zephyr we know are working with Zephyr, like uh, the Jerry script and the MicroPython. So we can have a more complete environment coming into play. Um, right now we have these developer tools available. And IAR is another compiler suite. And they've just finished um, donating uh, five licenses to Zephyr. 
So we're working on making sure that um, that, tools, that tool chain will work with Zephyr in the next little bit. So I'm hoping to have that their logo up here soon. And once IAR is working with it, we will have gotten rid of the GCC-isms. Um, and so a lot of the proprietary compilers should be working with it just fine too. So as I've said at the start, supported hardware is um, these six architectures. And we do have the native POSIX now. So these are giving us a pretty good foundation for Zephyr. So what's next? Well, we're aiming towards safety and security certifications. This has been the vision for the project right from the start, is we wanted to build an RTOS that we could go after these things with. Um, in 2015, we came up with this diagram, and it's still true today. What we've been working on up till just this year has been the development phase, uh, that development repo. In April, we cut our first LTS, or long-term support, and from there, we're gonna be taking a subset of it and making that ready for going through audits and making that part of that safety certified. So all of these code bases are available to everyone. It's open source. And we're one of the few projects that's really looking at trying to do this type of thing with it. Um, products ready to be certified using that subset of the code base. All of these are gonna be visible and available. The development um, code base, right from this, you know, we have been focusing pretty hard on, in the last year, on making sure that we have that mandatory quality inspection. You know, what people expect is there. It is effectively the foundation for it. And we are running um, a lot of tooling, Coverity, Cautionelle, some of these other um, scanning tools to try to make sure that we have the quality there and we will continue to be doing that. The long-term support was designed to be available for products, as I've said. It's also going to have a security updates going with it. We have a security team and a pre-cert team specifically that is able to handle um, vulnerabilities. And we have handled vulnerabilities on behalf of the project. Um, we are looking at the LTS to be compatible with new hardware and to have be more tested. Um, but we're not going to be putting a lot of features in, and it's not going to be the cutting edge. Development stays active for that. So 1.14 is our LTS, and 2.0 has started, and that's the development brand. That's the development tree now. And from the 1.14 subset, we'll be taking the auditable. So as we've been working on it, security is obviously key for us in this space. And so we do have a security committee. It meets bi-weekly. Our secure computing practices have been publicly documented. Uh, the slides for this have been posted, and the links you can click on and download. Um, one of the things we're rather proud of is that Zephyr is a CNA, or a CVE numbering authority, which means that we're actually getting researchers reaching out and telling us about vulnerabilities in advance, because we can assign numbers to them. And then we can work with them to help mediate it and make things visible um, on a reasonable schedule. So we're one of the few open source projects that actually has taken that step um, uh, to participate at that level. Uh, the other thing that we're kind of proud of as a team is there's a best practices badge that is available in terms of best practices for open source projects. And uh, Zephyr is one of the first, uh, one of the three that made up to gold. So there's a lot of, if you have a chance to look at those best practices, um, they're good project. They're good practices for projects, but the gold level had some interesting ones to work through. And we got that. We finally got gold in February of this year. And so we're taking it. You know, everything we can figure out what to do, we're trying to do. <laughs> and so we're learning as we go a little bit. But um, I think we're on a pretty good track. And we have Coverity scans running on behalf of the project, the same way the Linux kernel does. And we're also working on incorporating Mizra scans, so that we've got those available for us. Um, again, when we sort of set out the project, we started looking at figuring out what sort of um, standards we wanted to adhere to. And obviously, this, the coding standards of quality of the MISRA is pretty much where we landed up. And then 61508 
is where most of our members agreed they wanted to work the funding. Um, there is some interest in going to the new FIPS. Uh, FIPS 140-3 uh, just came out. And so the security team is looking at working towards that as well. Now, as I've said, uh, the first target for this project is going to be 61508. And it's going to be a subset of the LTS. It's not the full LTS, it's just a subset. Um, and then we'll be using more rigorous processes there. And then we'll be basically documenting our processes and then working between the three committees, the technical steering, the security, and the safety to make sure we have something that's going to be working as a part of the open source project perspective. And right now, um, if you look for what's publicly available, and if people know things that I don't have here, please come talk to me <laughs> and tell me about them. I'd like to learn. Um, but uh, Free RTOS has had a path to doing a safety certified project. And uh, obviously, when Amazon acquired Free RTOS, they kept the same path. Um, Zephyr has been publicly visible that they're taking the LTS and Auditable here, which you've seen about. Um, so we have that explicit path. Uh, these other RTOSs, I have not seen a story yet visible. That's not to say there isn't one. I just don't know it. So please come tell me, and I'll add them on to the other side. But I am trying to figure out who else is trying to go after safety certification. So our scope is there's a blog post, and I've got the link to the blog post that we put out in January. And the parts in orange are likely to be the initial parts we're going to be taking through the safety certification and uh, making getting all the requirements and reverse engineering and documentation ready for. Zephyr itself has um, a variety of use cases that are starting to emerge now. Not as only is it just being used on very small sensor cores, we're seeing it being used in OpenAMP as well as on multi-core systems and with support with hypervisors. So we're seeing instances of all of these configurations now starting to be used. And of course, when you start getting complex, the safety and security requirements grow up too. So these are things that are being considered. So our roadmap is looking sort of like this right now in the sense that we are going to be realistically making sure we've got the commercial compiler support, the MISRA compliance, multi-core, split layer for Bluetooth, and um, the advanced power management stuff kicking in this year. Um, as we head to 2020, we'll be adding more of the code base, the certifiable code base we've been working, we're working towards on that you know, alternate view. And by 2021, we're trying to get some of our safeties publicly visible. Now, one of our members is working on an accelerated path, and so we'll see what emerges, so maybe this roadmap will change in. But that's roughly what our plans are right now. So if you're interested in learning more about Zephyr, um, there's some more orientation information. Again, I've posted the slides um, in the conference proceedings, and you can go and link to them, and then click on the links. And that's linked to our GitHub project. You can check the Insights number yourself, as well as our mail list. And we have a Slack channel, which is tend to be how the team tends to interact worldwide. Um, we do have participants completely coming in from all over the world, including um, there's a pretty nice big team here in, in Shanghai, I've been told now. There's uh, about 10, 15 total between the two companies. Yep. And they're, they're having regular meetups now. And so um, I'd encourage you to reach out. Um, to on the WeChat channels and find them and see if you want to join and learn more about Zephyr. And with that, any questions? Please. Please. Uh, I, I have several questions. Okay. Uh, yeah. The first one is about the uh, safety certification. The mm -hmm. 61508, yeah. uh, and I think it's a general um, a certification of uh, a former uh, certification like the ISO 262622. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, was uh, all the Zephyr be certifi uh, certified by this uh, uh, certificate uh, organization, or only one part of the kernel to be certified? So what we're doing is the parts that are in orange, uh -huh. we will work with to get 61508. Now, to get a 262662, 26262, 
Um, if you've got 61508, it's a question of generating a few more tables, and so you're pretty close. Other of our members are very interested in medical, which is also a derivative of 61508. And so the fact that we have 61508 as a basic, we can go into many dimensions, industrial and railway and so forth. So there's a variety of other standards that we can pick up from, but getting the discipline with 61508 gives us a good starting point, and that's why we chose it. Okay, so uh, uh, actually the ecosystem is not uh, in, in this, um, I mean, in this scope, like uh, the, I, I mean, the mesh protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, no, we're not taking and doing all the, the IP stacks. There's one, some people that are interested in it, uh -huh. but to get ourselves there, we have to build, we have to start small, make sure we know what we're doing, because we're having to bootstrap ourselves. I mean, no one else okay. has done it before. Okay. So we're keeping our scope limited, making sure we're solid there, and then we'll grow out from there. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got that. And uh, the, 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 uh, another question is about the, um, is uh, this certification want to be applied to the, I mean, uh, automotive? Yeah, yeah. I, some of our members are specifically looking at automotive and 26262. Yeah, so far. Other members uh, are looking at different yeah, things. Yeah, this, so far, no, it's uh, only applied on the IoT. I mean, so uh, in future time, uh, that it will be applied to automatically. Yeah, um, so the, the key for certification is you have to look at the entire system, okay? And what we're trying to do is get our little component ready to be put into an analysis of an entire system. So we won't be, you know, blanket 26222 ready, but we will be having enough there that people can go after 26262 without a lot of cost. Okay. That's what we're trying for. Okay, thank you. And uh, <laughs> one more question is about the architecture. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I I saw that that um, that first support the memory protection. So mm -hmm. is that depend on the architecture? Like uh, they already have uh, needed to have an MPU unit or yeah. a memory unit. Yeah, it's very much architecture specific. What specific uh, features are enabled for the memory protection, and what's in the hardware to work from. And, uh, but if it's there, the project has to take advantage. Okay. Oh, uh, will it support the MMU or? Oh yeah. Oh, support the MMU. There are some supports in some of the parts. So, um, do you want to? Do, does one of you guys want to comment more about it? Okay. So yeah. it uh, now now it supports the thread only, but not the processor. Processes, I mean, uh, uh, 你好，我说我说中文嘛， 就是它现现在是进程还是线程级别的？ Okay, okay, thank you, I got it. Okay, I think there's some good conversations to go on yeah. after the session is over. But again. Oh, is there one more, do we have time for one more question or are we out of time? I'm out of time? Okay, well, I will be hanging around the back. So thank you again for showing up and thank you for your interest. Bye-bye.